Romans chapter 2. We want to begin this morning just with a, to give you an outline on the whole question of sin, because this is one of the issues that God's people are still wrestling with, the whole question of sin. And so uh, we need to understand what sin is, we need to understand uh, how it affects our life, and whether today we should be still walking in this thing we call sin, or whether we should be walking free from it. Actually, the Bible is very clear on these things, but there are some issues that you need to recognize today. And the first one is that at Mount Sinai, when Israel came to Mount Sinai after their stint in uh, Egypt, you remember that God came down on that mountain and gave to them the law of commandments. Moses brought the stones, the two pieces of stone, with the commandments written by the finger of God down to Israel. But remember that they failed anyway because they were dancing around a golden calf by the time he came down so he dropped those stones and they were broken. The church in this world today for 2,000 years has put the Gentile people under the law of commandments. And that has been the greatest fallacy, of course, of all time. And because of that, then everybody has been uh, told that we are all sinners and we have broken God's law and therefore there has to be a penalty for that. And so we have the judgment of God which has been preached all over the world for the 2,000 years. So I want to clear up some things with you this morning, show you from the Word of God, not just from my concept of the thing, but I want to show you what God says. You see, because if you are under the law, then you must have a judge. If you're under the law and you have a judge, you also must have a penalty. So for Israel, they had the law and they were given the law they basically signed the law when they said to Moses, all that God has said, we will do. So they virtually put their signature to it. So they were under the law and they had to have a judge and God was their judge. And because there was a law and they had a judge, they had a penalty. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now I want you to turn to Romans chapter 2 and verse 14. And the Apostle Paul is speaking here and he says, for when the Gentiles which do not have the law. So the first thing you notice is no Gentile was ever under the law of commandments. I do not believe that God ever intended to write the law on anything. Uh, that's in terms of writing it on pieces of stone as an external law. Why is that? Because in all of nature, God wrote the laws that governs nature within the creature itself. You don't have to teach a bird to fly. You don't have to teach a, a fish to swim. You don't have to teach a, a dog to bark. The law of God was written into all of nature so that they follow 
the pattern that God set for all of those creatures. And so you don't even see uh, a dog born into a cat family or a, or a, horse, born in, a horse born into a, the ox family or whatever. You see, the law of God was written in them. The interesting thing is that the only creature that has rebelled against the law of God has been man himself. And what kind of a man can you imagine that I have to go to and say, Sir, I don't want you to kill anybody. You know that's a bad thing to do. Do I have to go and tell a man that he should not kill? No, sir. Does not everybody know that it's wrong to kill? Should I have to go to somebody and say, listen, it's not a good idea to commit adultery. You know, you really should not do that. Should I have to tell anybody that? I don't think so. We know all of those things. We don't need anybody to tell us that those things are wrong. But for Israel, because they were uh, a people that were disobedient right from the beginning, the very men from which the tribes came fought and argued amongst themselves. And remember that uh, when Joseph was born and he was the the priest of the family that uh, the father made him, the priest of the family, that the brothers hated him, they were going to kill him. And they were, the, they were the leaders or they were the ones from which the tribes of Israel came. So you see, God had to give them a written law. But I want to tell you, if you have teenagers, if you wrote that law and put it on the wall of their bedroom, in, you know, 12-inch uh, size letters, do you think that would make your children holy? No. I don't think so. But the point I want to make this morning is that no Gentile has ever been under the law of God. You got that? Paul says here, and the Gentiles which do not have the law, now, I'm not saying that the Gentiles are lawless. I'm saying that they were never put under the law of commandments. And therefore, there are two Gospels in the Bible. And for some of you, that may be a, quite a shock to understand that. But there are two Gospels because there had to be a Gospel that suited those that were under the law and there had to be a gospel for the Gentiles who are not under the law because the whole concept of sin is totally different between those two. For instance, if Israel sinned, they broke the law. John in his epistle, because he wrote to what we call the dispersion, that was Israel when they were scattered around the world. He wrote to them and said, Sin is the transgression or the breaking of the law. And so that was Israel. When they sinned, it was a legal issue. You understand? It was a legal issue because it came under the, the concept of law. Now, if you get pulled up by the, the uh, state patrol police there out on the highway and you're doing 100 miles an hour in a 50 mile an hour zone and you say, but please, sir, I wasn't thinking, you know, I didn't really intend to do that. You know, please, you know, give me a little bit of grace here. <laughs> He's just going to tell you, sir, you've broken the law and you must pay the price, the penalty. Why? Because under law, there is no grace. You cannot have grace under law. Because if you break the law, then you are guilty 
There's no question about it. If you break the law, you are guilty. So therefore, you cannot have grace. If you want to enjoy grace, then you must not be under a law. You cannot be. So, let's uh, go over the page. We're in Romans now, and chapter 3 and verse 19. I want you to follow this, because uh, as I travel the world and meet so many different kinds of people, and people from various church persuasions and what have you, this is a real issue, and I want you to settle it in your heart and in your mind today. It says here in verse 19, chapter 3, we know that whatever the law says, it says to them that are under the law. So Paul is making it very clear that there has to be a distinction here. He said that whatever things the law says, it will say to those that are subject to that law. For instance, if I drive here in the United States and I drive on the left-hand side of the road, if I don't get killed, the police will probably pull me up and say, hey, you're breaking the law. I say, what do you mean? Well, you're driving on the wrong side of the road. I say, no, I'm not. I'm driving on the left side of the road. I come from Australia because that's our law. He said, but sir, I'm sorry. You're not in Australia now. You're in the United States. Therefore, you come under the law of the United States. You understand? We are not Jews in the biblical sense. We are Gentiles and therefore we were not under the law of God. So therefore the law as a law does not apply to us. Therefore I cannot break the law. I am a Gentile. Now, it doesn't mean I cannot sin. Don't run away and you know get ahead of me. I know you'd like to ask me 20 questions right now. I'll answer them all for you, but just wait and listen. The law is applied to those that are under the law. If Paul says the Gentiles were never under the law, then we were not under that law. Therefore, the law does not apply to us in terms of its legal stature. So he says, those that are under the law are those that, to whom the law has been given. Therefore, he says in verse 20, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in the sight of God. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Most Christians in the world today have a consciousness of sin. And if you have a consciousness of sin, I will tell you one thing. You will never, never, never come into the presence of God. Amen. You cannot. Not because God won't let you. It's because you won't let you. In other words, let me put this into its context now. In the tabernacle, God dwelt in the most holy place. But in the front of the most holy place was a curtain. There was a veil. And that veil was just simply material. Tell me, do you think God put that veil there to keep people out? I don't think so. If God wanted to keep people out, he would have put a stone wall there or something else that would have been, you know, nobody would have been able to get through. But he put a curtain there. Do you realize that a child could have gone to the end of that curtain <coughs> and just pulled it aside and walked in? It wasn't to keep people out. Well, then why didn't Israel go in? Why didn't people want to go in and, and, and simply walk around the curtain? No, because they had broken the law. They had broken the law. 
Therefore they were guilty and therefore they would never walk into the presence of God. You got this? And I want to tell you today there are many Christians who have never been in the presence of God. Amen. In, in, in reality. Amen. Or you've closed your eyes and you've prayed, you know, and you may have been in meetings where the presence of God is, you know, has been felt by many people, but you would never have been in the actual presence of God. Because when Adam took the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for I don't know how many years he'd been in that garden, but he had walked with God and talked with God. He was one with God. He fellowshiped with God. He was absolutely one with God. When God looked at him, he saw himself. When Adam looked at God, he saw himself. You see? But when he took the fruit of that tree, he's hiding from God behind the trees. He's not walking with God. Well, God now, he's enemy. You see? And I want to tell you that the church in this world has put all Gentiles under the law and therefore they believe they are sinners in the sight of God. And the best they can say is, uh, well, of course, I'm a, I'm a Christian today and I've been saved by the grace of God. Well, I say, do you still sin? Oh, yes, doesn't everybody? No, they don't. <laughs> so, you see, we have this problem that we have been kept out of the presence of God because we believed a lie. Mm, that's true. Okay, don't run ahead of me. We're going to cover a lot more yet. <laughs> it says here... The righteousness, verse 21, uh, of God without the law is now being manifested. When the Apostle Paul talks about righteousness, how do you become righteous? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34, if you want to put it in your notes, the Apostle Paul says, Awake! to righteousness. What does he say? Wake up and you will discover you are righteous. You got that? Wake up. That's all. God said, Abraham, count the stars. He said, I can't, Lord. He said, so shall I see be. And the Bible declares God, uh, that God credited Abraham as being righteous. How did he become righteous? Did he stop sinning? No. He believed God. And I want you to believe God today because it's going to set you free if you can believe God. Amen. So it says here now, I want you to look at chapter 4 of Romans. So we're not going too far here. It says in verse um, 15, Because the law worketh wrath. You know, the law worketh wrath. Why? Because the concept is that if you break the law, God's angry with you. And how many Christians in the world today believe God's angry with them? Oh my. Mm -hmm. I meet them everywhere I go. And that's why we have an angry God that's being preached all over the world. For 2,000 years the church has been preaching an angry God. He's angry with everybody. Why? Well, we've all broken the law. I don't think so. Now listen to what it says here. Verse 15. The law worketh wrath, but where there is no law, there is no sin. Amen. I didn't write the book. Come on. Amen. Right. This is the Apostle Paul. Where there is no law, there is no sin. Listen. 
If there was no speed limit on your roads here in the United <coughs> States, you could go 100 miles an hour every way you wanted to go. And the police couldn't touch you because there's no law. But there is a law there. So you understand, where there's no law, there's no sin. The Apostle Paul said, I was doing real well, you know. I was just trusting in the Lord and believing God. And then somebody brought the law to me. And he said, it killed me. See? Because the law, well, it'll kill you. Oh God, help us here. So, because of this, when a, a Jew, when, when Israel sinned, it was a legal issue. They had broken a law that God had given to them. Therefore, they were guilty before God. There was no grace there. If you committed adultery in Israel, they would take you out in the paddock and they would stone you to death. But sir, I'm sorry. You know, it was just a spur of the moment thing. I mean, I didn't really mean to do that. And I promise you I'll never do it again. Out in the paddock, you're dead. There's no grace in the law. That's right. Don't try and even put it in there because it doesn't work. There's no grace in the law. If you break the law, you've broken the law, you will pay the penalty. What do they say? Do the crime, you do the time. You see? But where there's no law, there is no sin. So now, you say to me, but uh, doesn't the Bible tell us that everybody sin? Oh, yes. Uh, let me see now. <laughs> this is chapter 3 of Romans. And he says in verse 23, for all have sinned. See, they said, now there you are, there's you, you got it all wrong, you see. We have all sinned. <laughs> ah, but wait a minute. What did we do, what did the Gentiles do to sin? Did they break the law? No, because they were not under the law. It had nothing to do with law. Are you hearing this? Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with law. Yes, we have all sinned. But what did we do in order to sin? We came short of the glory of God. Amen. The word sin in the Bible, uh, in, the, in the Greek language, is harmatia or harmaton. And what does it mean? It's a sporting term. It has nothing to do with law. It's a sporting term. In the Olympic Games, when the man shooting the arrows uh, at the target there, right. and he's playing in the Olympic Games, and he misses the bullseye. Right. They all cry out, you sin, you sin, you sin. <laughs> did he break the law? No. What did they do? Did they kill him? I mean, they put him in jail. Well, what did they do? They say, you're a wicked, terrible, awful man. Now they said, here's another five arrows. Have another go. I think you probably hit the target next time. <laughs> we all have sinned. But what did God say? You are a sinner and you'll not be able to stand in my presence and I don't want you there because I'm angry with you now and I'm going to punish you somehow. I'm going to put my judgment upon you. Come on. What does God say when you sin? He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to help you. And next time you see sin, the word sin means to miss the mark. That's what it means. To miss the mark. In the Hebrew language, it means the same thing. It means you could be traveling along this road and... You should have gone straight ahead, but there was a road that went off this way, and you took the wrong road. Same word. You sinned. Got nothing to do with law. 
We do not have an angry God. Amen. Amen. Isn't that good? Yes. We do not have an angry God. Our God is a happy God. Yes. Amen. And he wants, in fact, he's blessed all of us. Yes. Before the foundation of the world, he chose you in Christ and blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. So now, we've got a different picture here. Yes, we have all sinned, but our sin was not the breaking of a law. Our sin was to miss the mark, which is the standard of the character of Jesus Christ. Yes. Every word that you speak, every thought in your mind, every action, is checked against the character of Jesus Christ. That's God's standard. You got it? That's God's standard. And, and if you miss that mark, no, God doesn't get angry with you. He said, I'm going to bless you. Next time, you'll hit that mark. If you don't, I'm going to bless you some more. I'm going to help you and encourage you. Until you hit the mark. That's grace. That's how grace works. You see? So these are very interesting thoughts, aren't they not? So we've all sinned. But, and we've come short of the glory of God. Yes, sir. But now let me tell you something else. When Moses came down that mountain and saw Israel dancing around the golden calf, he dropped those stones and they broke. They had a broken law before it was even given to Israel. God says, come on back up. Another 40 day fast, you know. No food, no water. I, uh, Moses is up there on the mountain again. He went up several times, not just once. And God said, bring two more stones up this time. So he took two more pieces of stone and God wrote the law again. And he said, Moses, listen carefully. Don't give these stones to Israel. Because you'll drop them again. See? But I will tell you what, you, what, what you've got to do. I want you to put those stones in the Ark of the Covenant. Which represents Jesus Christ. Yeah. The Lord of the whole earth. Yes. <coughs> put them in there. Why? Because Jesus Christ for 33 and a half years lived on this earth and he fulfilled the law yes. absolutely, totally <coughs> and completely. Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen. Yes. And he dwells in you. Yes. And he dwells in you. Hallelujah. He dwells in you. Thank you, my Lord. Come on. He yes. dwells in you. Yes. What's that mean? Christ is my identity. Christ is your identity. Yes. He's kept the law. Yes. Mm -hmm. Complete. So if you really want to hang on to the law, it's okay because he's fulfilled the law and he dwells in me. Yes. Oh, Lord, help us this morning. Yes. Lord, just give us the ability <coughs> to receive your word yes. and to let it function in us because... I want you to be free this morning. Amen. I want to open the prison doors for the yes, people yes. that are still bound by sin. You're still bound by a mind that said, no, I've broken God's law and God's angry with me. Well, here's your chance. The door's wide open. <laughs> so you see, the, the uh, stones were put in the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law totally and completely and he dwells in me <clears throat> therefore as God sees me I have never sinned That's right. Amen. and neither have you Thank you, Lord. Good news. Good news. if Christ is your identity has Christ ever sinned tell me come on no. has Christ ever sinned no. no well then you haven't sinned come on you see mm -hmm. we, we have this mind has gotten around. We've got all these verses about God's judgment and everything. And, and it filled our mind until we couldn't possibly think 
that we could be sinless in the sight of God. As a matter of fact, the prophet said, God's eyes are so pure that they cannot behold evil or sin. He can't even look at it. He doesn't even see it. <coughs> and you see, when your eyesight has been corrected by the Spirit of God, when you look out into the world, you will not see evil either. Because there is no good and evil in God's world. He never created it. He never created evil. Therefore, there is no evil. Evil is a concept of the human mind, of the natural mind. That's all it is. It's a concept. If I came up and cut you with a knife, you'd say that's evil. But you can go to a hospital and a doctor can cut you from here right down to here and open up your chest and take your heart out and do a whole lot of stuff and put it all back. And that's good. But he's cut you. Oh. There's no evil in this world. Turn to chapter 9 of Romans. I'm just trying to follow the Lord here to see what he wants to say to you. In verse 11, Romans chapter 9, The children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her that the elder would serve the younger. And so Esau, who was born first, became the servant of the one that was born second, that was Jacob. And he also ended up with the birthright and the patriarchal blessing. Because God had declared it. Now, it says here then, verse 19, you will say to me, why does he yet find fault? For who hath resisted the will of God? Nobody. No, he said, but O oh man, verse 20, who art thou to reply against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why have you made me? Like this. See? So when we talk about the reconciliation of all things, when we talk about every knee that will bow to Jesus Christ, every tongue that will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father, you say, don't tell me that, that you know, everywhere. What about Hitler? What about Idi Amin? What about some of these crazies that are in the world, to, in the world today? Well, what about them? Listen to this. Hath not the potter, verse 21, power over the clay? Of the same lump, of the same lump, look, look at this carefully, of the same lump. He's talking about one lump of clay. And he's dividing it, you know, in, into two parts. He picks up the first part, and what does it say? He makes one vessel unto honor out of that piece of clay. With the other piece of clay, he makes another vessel, but it's unto dishonor. Now what's he talking about? Because we need to understand this. <coughs> because God is the potter. We are the clay. And he's made us all. And every person on the earth, he has created. So it says now, that out of one piece of clay, he can make one vessel unto honor, one unto dishonor. What is the difference? In Australia, you know, it's a bit like America. We have uh, what we call uh, a rubbish bin. 
<coughs> it's now called a wheelie bin because it's got wheels on it. <laughs> and the council supplies them and you you put them. Now, we, we have one of these wheelie bins. We put all our trash, as you call it, in there. Uh, but what do we do with that wheelie bin? Do we put that in our lounge room? No. Do we put it at the entrance to our house, like at the foyer? No. We put it at the back of the house. Why? It's a vessel unto dishonor. But is it necessary? Oh, of course. If you don't have that, you've got your rubbish all over the place. So you put it in the bin. It's a vessel unto dishonor, but it's a vessel that is necessary. Are you hearing this? Yes. So God makes one vessel unto honor. That's, you know, like Gary, Gary Sigler, a vessel unto honor that God has blessed and used and uh, he has helped so many, many, many people. But he's also made a Hitler. He's also made a Nidhi Amin. You say, why? <coughs> <clears throat> you better ask the potter, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessary for me to know the reasons. He says, can I argue with the potter and say, why did you make this like this? Why did you make this man like this? You can't argue with the potter. He knows what he's doing. You see, we, we have murder, we have rape, we have all kinds of things going on in the world. And you say, you know, does God, is, is he somehow involved in all of this? Vessels unto dishonor? As I said, if you're going to try and use your puny little natural mind to, to understand the ways of God, you might as well quit while you're in front. <laughs> It'll drive you crazy because you'll never work it out. You see, we live in time. We are limited by this clock thing. So when something happens, it happens in time. It means five minutes before, it wasn't there. But in five minutes time, there it is, it's happened now. In another five minutes or another five years, You've forgotten about what happened there. Yeah. But see, God lives in eternity. God is not limited by time. Which means that God sees the ends from the beginning. In fact, he says, I'm a very strange God, you know. Because I start at the end. And then I work back toward the beginning. See, nobody else does it like that. Why? Because we don't know five minutes from now what's going to happen. We, we don't know next week what's going to happen. But he knows because he's not limited in time. You understand? Yes. So when you see an accident or when you hear of somebody that's been hurt badly by something or other or even a, a terrorist uh, thing or whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. We just see it in the context of time. The hurt, the, the discomfort, the, 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 the deprivation of liberty in some places, in some cases, and all sorts of things. But we only see it just in that, that particular time frame. We don't see what the effect has been on many, many other people. For instance, you have a car accident, somebody was killed. You say, oh, well, somebody died. Yeah, but what about their family? What about their relatives? What about their friends? They're all that were affected by that thing. See, we don't understand. But see, God knows the ends from the beginning of every experience that's on this earth. He knows. And everything is working together. What does the Apostle Paul say? All things work together into good to them that love God. Why? Because if you love God, you're not going to argue with God why he did this, why he did that. We love God because I believe my Heavenly Father knows what he's doing. Amen. You see? I don't have to be able to explain to you why this happens and why that happens. 
I don't have to be able to explain that to you. All I know is my father is a loving father. And I want to tell you, anything that he allows to happen has a good reason behind it. But we may not know that reason until we are in the glory with him. Then perhaps. But I won't even be asking him then, because I know, shall not the Lord of all the earth do right? You see? When you start to attribute all the accidents and, and all the people that have been killed in war and like in Kenya just recently, uh, 300,000 people in refugee camps now, and you think, God, what are you doing? You know, you allow all this? See, he knows the ends from the beginning. Right. Don't argue with God. Hallelujah. He says he can make one vessel unto honor and one unto dishonor. He knows what he's doing. But every vessel on this earth, listen, every vessel on this earth is where they need to be doing what they need to be doing. Yes. Amen. And only God could run that show. Amen. You see? Only God. Don't try to put yourself in the place of God and say, well, you know, how can I work all that out? No. Only God could do that. And my God is a loving Father. And Jesus Christ said, I haven't lost one Father that has given me. That's right. The only one I've lost is this crazy mind that has messed things up for many, many people. Yeah. And many times our problems are really of our own doing because we will not trust God, we trust our natural mind. So it's so very important for us. So we're beginning to get a little bit of a picture here. Now I want you to turn to Galatians, the epistle to the Galatians. And this is the Apostle Paul again, of course. And in chapter 1, in verse 16, verse 15 first, it says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by His grace. You see, there are many things that God is doing in the earth, and this is one of them. He's calling people today. He said, when he separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that is the divine purpose of God for everybody on this earth. To reveal Christ through their being. If you like, through their body. To reveal his son to me that I might preach him among the heathen. Mm -hmm. He said, immediately, I did not confer with flesh and blood. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah. 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 yeah, well, we should have read that, you know, when we got converted, shouldn't we? <laughs> immediately, yeah. you should not have confided in flesh and blood. Yeah. But we all, we all listen to some flesh and blood man, person woman, whatever it was, and they told us a whole lot of stuff. Wow. <laughs> and it took us years to get rid of it. <laughs> but Paul, he's on the Damascus road there, and he's, you put the stake in the ground, and you put a chain on their ankle, and they'll just walk around, and they, that's it. When they get old, they've walked around that stake, when, when they put that chain on, they know they can't move it. But actually, those elephants could just root that thing out of the ground, no problem at all. Why don't they? Because they've got so used to it. That's right. And when people are so used to being a sinner, so used to crying to God every time they come into the presence of God. I, I've had people, you know, they come to me and, and they want, they're crying. Oh, oh, pray for me. I need God, you know. I've got all these problems. And, and they say, do you, do you do this every time you come to God? Yes, I cry to the Lord every time. I say, if, I, if every time I went to my father I cried, 
he'd tell me, go away, will you? I'm not when you're happy. I mean, you know, every time somebody comes into a, a meeting where there's a sense of the presence of God, they want to cry. Why? Because they're feeling guilty. Get rid of your guilt today, I'm telling you. You're free. You're not under the law. You're under grace. Jesus Christ, he was the one that brought grace and truth. They go together. Amen. Grace and truth. You'll never understand grace unless you know the truth. Right. And I just tried to tell you the truth today. That sin is not breaking the law. For us Gentiles, we were never under the law. Alright, so the gospel of the circumcision was given to Peter. The gospel of the uncircumcision was given to Paul. That's why the Pauline epistles basically, are the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. Amen. So this is important for us today. Yes. It's important because there are so many things that are attached to this. Now I want you to go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And here in, in verse 20... 21. It says, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and when he slept, the Lord God took that rib or took the female part out of him. The woman, separate from the man, is part of the Adamic dream world. The woman separated from the man, is a part of the Adamic dream. God never created a woman. But in our world, of course, um, you know, the, the division between the sex, the sexes, is very, very prominent. And in many of the countries, the third world countries particularly, the woman has suffered terribly as being kind of second class. And that has uh, basically, it's been the church that has produced that also. Because the church has taught that the woman is the weaker vessel. And of course you know that the Apostle Paul said something very, very strong about the woman, didn't he? Uh, in the epistle that he wrote to Timothy. What was it here? I, I'd like to just look for you to look this up with me. First Timothy. Chapter, uh, chapter 2. For Adam... Uh, verse 12. Uh, most of you will have this marked in your Bible, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> it says that I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Lord help us. What was Paul really saying? You see, he is, he, this is what I'm, I'm trying to get over this morning. That we read the Bible, but we only read the ink on the paper. That's all we do. That's fact. We have never stopped and said, Father, you're trying to tell me something here. I can't actually see it with my eyes, but I know you're trying to tell me something. And if we can hear his voice, this is what he's going to tell you. Paul is not here telling us that the woman, per se, that is just the, the woman as a female, is not allowed to preach or teach. That is not what Paul is talking about. Because there are many in the Bible, I mean, you know, there are many uh, uh, prophetesses in the Old Testament and women of leadership in Israel. That's quite a few there. You can go through them for yourself. What was he saying? He's talking about the woman taken out of the man. In other words, 
He's talking about the living soul. Well, if he's talking about the living soul, he's talking about everybody. Because we all became that woman. Everybody on this earth became the living soul. And that means that we were living out of a portion of what we should have been living out of. And the main part of what we should have been living out of has been totally ignored. That is the spirit. That's our identity. And that is the whole concept of God himself is locked up in that spirit. All the potential of God is not vested in the soul of man. It's vested in the spirit of man. Right? But as a living soul, we are living out of our own uh, capacity to think, to understand, and whatever we can do. So you see, he wasn't really talking just about the female sex and saying, no, you're not allowed to preach. He was saying, I don't allow anybody, man or woman, to get up in that pulpit who is living out of their soul life and to preach. Amen. Well, brother, that's going to put a whole lot of preachers out of business today. I tell you, that will put a lot of preachers out of business because they're just simply preaching out of their soul life. In other words, they've, they've been to the Bible school or they've been to the theological cemetery and they've come back with all the knowledge and, the, and, and their degrees and everything else and they simply put their sermons together. It's soulish. That's right. I'm not saying it necessarily has to be bad or evil or wicked. I'm just saying it's soulish. It doesn't contain the very essence of God because that's in the spirit, yeah. not in the soul. Amen. And we all became the living soul. So you and I have got to put this thing back together again. So you'll notice here, of course, in chapter 3, or oh, whatever, first of all, in chapter 1, it says in verse 28 in chapter 1, And God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So now I want you to understand that this is what you have to do. This is what you have to do. We have to be fruitful, we have to multiply, and we have to fill the earth with the God kind of people. Not just with kids, with the God kind of people. And so you cannot do this until there has been a reunion. That is, for us, it is a reunion. But in reality, it's to wake up. It's to wake up and get out of the Adamic dream, which says, I've been separated from God. So we have to just wake up get out of the Adamic dream and then we can begin to be fruitful and multiply. Amen. But to do it, we have to become one with Him. Yes. I have to finish there just because of the machine. Yeah. So may God bless you there.